Tim Legler, ESPN, here on the Boardwalk Honda Hotline. We'll start off with that, Legs. You know, the Sixers, obviously, it's always a game of adjustments. See what happens in game one, make the adjustments for game two. Brett Brown has said before, now we didn't change a whole heck of a lot. We just did what we do better. Will that fly this time around, or they need to make some actual changes and adjustments? Well, I think it depends, Mike, on what aspect we're talking about here. So if you're talking about Joel Embiid, I think it's just play better and, and be more patient when you get the ball in the post and play more like a power player. He's at his best when he keeps his dribble, gets deeper, is more patient before he releases the ball. I thought he got rushed a little bit in game one. He was taking some off-balance shots that I actually – if you look at it, you would even label some of those attempts soft in the paint, and that's not the way that he plays when he's at his best. So he needs to make a personal adjustment. He needs to make sure he's intent on catching it deeper, keeping his dribble, and then overwhelming whoever's guarding him at the rim. Like, that's when Joel Embiid is unstoppable. So that's an adjustment on him. I think from a team standpoint, there needs to be adjustment uh, on Kawhi and Pascal Siakam. Now, Kawhi is a little bit difficult because he's hard guy to double because he does so much work from the mid-range area to floor, and so he sees everything in front of him. So you can't just indiscriminately run double teams at him because you're going to give up some easy stuff. But he does spin a lot, and I think there are opportunities when you can leave Kyle Lowry and dare him to make some shots and go try to hit Kawhi a little bit when he gets into his dribble move because you know he's trying to get to a certain spot and then elevate over whoever's in front of him and make that 15 to 18 footer. So there are opportunities to run at him as he's coming out of his spin, or even if throughout the game, I think you have to selectively pick times that you've got to go run at him and get the ball out of his hands a little bit if he gets into the kind of rhythm, particularly that he did in game one. And then Siakam, I just think they didn't treat him with enough respect. Honestly, I thought the comment, even during the game that Brett Brown made, it seemed like, he, they were surprised by Pascal Siakam playing that well. And I'm going, if you've been watching him for the last two months, he's been playing at an all-star level literally the entire second half of the year. So that shouldn't have been a surprise. He's that good. Um, so now he needs to get a little bit more uh, prioritization from the Sixers before the game. Yeah, I agree with that. Uh, I, I thought uh, back in October, I like this team. They're better than I thought they were. And a lot of it is because this Siakam has come such a long way. But – they went out and got Gasol, and I wonder, is he the biggest problem the Sixers have? Can or can Joel Embiid overcome that? Or much like Embiid is in many players' head in the NBA, a la Andre Drummond or Whiteside, is Gasol in the brain right now of Joel Embiid? Well, you know, Joel Embiid doesn't have a lot of experience playing against him, so that could be a factor there. And, and Gasol's a big dude. He's a strong dude, and – he could put some weight on you when you're trying to back down, and I, I thought Joel Embiid gave up on his his moves too too soon, and he ended up taking these off balance, you know, fade shots or yeah. runners, and he was playing right into the hands of Marc Gasol. So that that could be part of it. You know, it's interesting watching Gasol when the trade was made. I said to myself, you know, this would have been great for the Raptors if this was Marc Gasol from three or four years ago, because I I just didn't think he had a lot left in the tank. I think what I was watching was regular season basketball. Because you can see, even in the first, you know, what they had in the first round in the first game against Philly, he's more of a playoff veteran. And this is what you got him for. Times like this, he won't be phased. He, he, you can't speed him up. He's going he's gonna to knock down shots if you leave him. He's going to be a guy that can play guys straight up in the post. He, he clogs the lane well on drives. He, he really knows how to play playoff basketball when they allow more contact. So now – you're going to see the true value of Marcus Saul for that team. Yep, uh, Tim Legler is with us. Let me ask you, uh, Golden State, Houston the other night, I noticed Golden State doesn't go to the bench very often. Their starters are out there, and they're out there for the duration. Does Brett Brown need to lay, uh, lay lean on his starters more? Can he lean on these guys more? I think he has to in this series. I, I don't think there's any question about it, and really the remainder of the playoffs, yes. I, you know, their depth is something that's been questioned, and – I think where I have a problem with questioning your depth is that's not taking into account the way you can stagger guys in that starting lineup. Like in a lot of ways, you know, Jimmy Butler, you know, he's your starting, he's your starting three, but he can also be your backup two. You know what I mean? He could also play some minutes at point. Same thing, Ben Simmons. Ben Simmons can play your point, but Ben Simmons can also go and, and play the four defensively. So, 
in a lot of ways, your starters are your depth on a team that's loaded like this in the starting lineup. So I think he may have to ride that a little bit more. The one problem, though, is, and, I, and I, I've seen this throughout Joel Embiid's season, there are times I watch him and I think he looks physically gassed. I don't know if it's the injury uh, and he doesn't have the lift, but sometimes he labors up and down the floor, even after short stretches of being on the court. And I think Brett Brown sees the same thing that I see. And he's trying to like get him off the floor, um, you know, more often than any star player in the league. If you really look at it, like star players in this league typically come out once a half, unless there's foul trouble, right? So, you know, most guys will come out, you know, three minutes left in the first quarter, and then you go back in at like the seven or eight minute mark of the second. Same thing in the second half. That that's standard NBA star rotation, and B comes out like three times a half. So. And I think it's because they look at him and there are times he doesn't look fresh. It's a big body. I get it. And and he's dealt with some injuries. But I don't think his conditioning is at a level where they feel comfortable leaving him out there more than five, six minutes at a time. And what's what's rough about that is it will disrupt his flow and I think disrupt the flow with their offense. But you need to have Joel Embiid on the floor 32 to 34 minutes, in my opinion. Not to be able to beat this team because Toronto is really good. Yeah, I, I mean, to me, if they can't get him going against Gasol, they got no shot. I mean, one of the reasons is your stars win. He's there. He's the guy that can get you thirty-five in a game consistently. Yeah, Butler can get you thirty-five. He can do it once in a while, not every night. Embiid's a guy that can get you the thirty-five every night. And if he's going to get you sixteen and take some shots from his hip. I mean, he was just taken off balance. He looked, he was so disengaged. That's got to change. But a lot of that could be from Gasol. I want to ask you about Ben Simmons, though. Uh, Tim Legler from ESPN with us. He didn't get completely shut down like we've seen him in the past. But he, did you feel he had much of an impact in the game the other night? Now, defensively, I thought he was there a little bit. But it just seemed like he was eh. Yeah, no, I, I hear you. He didn't put a stamp on the game. I, I think when you when you watched him in the first round against Brooklyn, uh, after game one, to me, that was the biggest change in their team was the fact that Ben Simmons was playing with almost a reckless abandon in his speed and trying to get to the rim and finish, but not just to get in there and make a play because there are times I've watched Ben Simmons and I feel like he premeditates making a play for somebody, even once he gets below the foul line. And I'm saying, no, the best opportunity for your team is for you to go ahead and take one more stride and get that thing to the rim. And when he started playing that way in the Brooklyn series, I felt it put so much pressure on Brooklyn to get back in transition, which led to some perimeter stuff for guys as trails, it, uh, to, to get into his driving lanes and put bodies in front because he was finishing so well. It created space for other people. Right. And so Ben Simmons did not play that way in the first game. And I think you're going to see him. Uh, you know, We talked about personal adjustments to start. The first question you asked me, that would be another one. You know, get back to that. I hope, hopefully, he went and watched some film of himself against Brooklyn when he was at his best. Because there were times in that series, I thought it was the best he's played offensively since he's been in the league. Right? How how, in, how intent he was to put pressure on them, and as a scorer, because I think sometimes it's an afterthought for him. He thinks more like a playmaker and a point guard, and that's great. But that's not necessarily the best play for your team. Sometimes you got to be a little bit more thinking about yourself because. He's such a unique physical talent. When he's getting to the rim and finishing the play or at least getting something up on the glass, it creates opportunities on the offense, the board for Embiid and, and, and Tobias Harris and the people. But more importantly, it's, it's a way for him to stamp the game. And I, I didn't think he did a very good job of that in the first game. Yeah, uh, you know, I think we both would agree, Tim, and I know he's not a great free throw shooter. He had been getting better there. But he's got to get to the line more than one time. Yes. yes. That is where. And the thing you know, is, people, and sometimes, Mike, you don't even focus on a percentage. Like, unless, obviously, you're talking fourth quarter and they're big ones that are game deciding, then, yeah, they got to go in. But it's, it's just as important for him to get the contact and get the call because it's going to put his team in the bonus. And now, good luck guarding Joel Embiid when you're in the bonus. You know, right. he's, playing, he's playing aggressively. Good luck you know, guarding even Jimmy Butler, the way he can attack when you're in the penalty. That, that's a much more difficult thing. And that's why, you know, Ben Simmons drawing a couple of those a quarter where he's getting to the rim. And even, if, even if he goes to the line and splits a pair, 
it's at the bottom line is fouls are adding up and it's helping other guys on your team right. be more unguardable. If he can get two fouls, if you're down in the post at six ten and you got Kawhi on you and you get him a foul or two, I mean that's invaluable. No, I completely agree with that. Um, you know, and look, look, let's give Toronto credit. This is a team that's really well defined in terms of their roles. They've got a great established pecking order now, which I'm a big believer in pecking order for teams offensively. And I think there have been teams that have been confused about that this year. They underachieved because of it. But to me, now that Siakam has emerged as a guy that's on this level, um, those other players are so accepting of their role definition that I think, you know, if you're Nick Nurse, you know what you're getting every night. And that's a good feeling as a head coach. You You feel confident. You can pencil in minutes, shot attempts, and for the most part, production with the understanding. You know, sometimes guys have off nights, but it's not like Nick Nurse is at a point where he goes into the locker room after the game and he says to himself, gee, well, where was, you know, whoever tonight? I didn't even notice him out there. Like, that's – they're past that. They're, they're really well connected defensively. They've obviously got a superstar that controls the game, probably outside of James Harden. Kawhi Leonard probably controls the game more than any other player in the league offensively because of his ability to keep his dribble through contact and still get to the spot he wants to. So he's got something clear in his mind he wants to do to you, and he does it. And from that standpoint, he controls possessions unlike anybody else besides James Harden. I think those two guys do it better than anybody, which means you've got to disrupt that. How do you do it? I think you selectively have to figure out times to hit him with a red, hit him with a blitz. Uh, maybe, you know, you pick a guy like Ben Simmons, if that's who you want on him, you find a way to make sure he gets more minutes on him rather than just handing him off indiscriminately to whoever. Because Kawhi Leonard's too good. If he, if he gets guys that he's comfortable against, you're not going to slow him down. He gets into that rhythm, that 15 to 18 foot area. You saw what happened in game one. He's virtually unstoppable, so you got to make sure that doesn't happen at the Do jump. Do you treat him like the Celtics tra- treated Giannis the other day? Um, maybe not quite to that extent. Um, I think Kawhi Leonard is better at making plays once he's you know committed to his dribble and you hit him with a guy in his driving lane or you hit him with a guy you know on a trap out on the floor, I, I think his overall IQ of reading the floor is better than Giannis. So I think if you go you know full board the way that they did, I did a tape on this yesterday. It was pretty fascinating to watch. They basically dared everybody on that team to make a shot, yeah. and they did not come through for him. Now he looked rattled. I thought he looked tight. He looked kind of nervous almost, which was kind of strange. But um, they dared those other guys to make shots. Brooke Lopez and Bledsoe and Connaughton. They're like, go ahead. The Middleton played great. The rest of those guys did not show up. And if they banged four or five of those threes in the first half that they had open looks on, Miritich, I'll put him in that category, it's going to be a different game for Giannis in terms of what he's looking at because you can't commit to him if guys are hitting shots. They never did, so they just continue to load up on him. But I don't think he reads the floor great once he puts it down. He has a difficult time making plays for people once he's headed toward the rim with a live dribble. Kawhi is much more under control, and he's going to make plays, and they've got enough three-point shooting at Toronto's team. It might not be to that extent that I would guard him the way Boston did, Giannis. Uh, Tim Legler, 10 years in the NBA, one of the best three-point sh- shooters uh, the league has seen. Probably be pretty good in this era right now. Uh, Tim Legler's basketballcamp.com and the early bird discount ends, what, uh, Wednesday? On Wednesday, Wednesday, yeah, exactly. You get your early early bird registration. We're, we're, we're way ahead of – we sell out every year, Mike, and honestly we are way ahead of pace – even from years past with three months to go before the camp because we moved it to a bigger facility at Total Turf over in Pittman. So we're, we can actually take more kids, and, and you can see the reaction um, of, of how fast it's filling up. But you still have a chance, a couple of days, to go on and register at TimLegnerBasketballCamp.com. Everything's on there. You can get the discount between now and Wednesday. And after that, it's still a great bargain. You're getting 20 hours of basketball for the week, high-level instruction. Your kid's going to come away from that a much better player and an understanding how to get better because we're going to give them the tools. So hopefully uh, people can come out. It's one of my favorite weeks of the year, July 29th to August 2nd. Yep, July 29th, August 2nd. You have till Wednesday to get that early bird discount, but you can still register at Tim Legler Basketball And uh, Sixers, Raptors tonight, game two. You have any feel that uh, the Sixers can end this 12-game losing streak in Toronto? 
Yeah, look, they've, they've got so much talent that, you know, they're one of those teams that, if, you know, if you fall behind 2-0, obviously, in any series, that, that's, a, that's, a, that's a tough road, right? you got to win four out of five, and, and you, you're down 2-0 because you're playing a really good team. So that's a hard thing to pull off. But if you're down 2-0 and then you're headed home with the kind of talent the Sixers have, they're, they're, they're one of the few teams I would look at and say, okay, they're still in this series. Um, having said that, can can they get to one one tonight? There's no question about it. They're going to play much better. There's no doubt in my mind. There there were too many things that we did not see in game one that we saw at their best in the regular season and certainly in the Brooklyn series, which gave them you know a hell of a test. We didn't see a lot of those things in the first game. You know, JJ Reddick's got to have a better start to the game, and Bead has to be much more forceful, aggressive, and powerful down low. Simmons, we talked about put more pressure on those guys. Let's see what they do tonight to mix up their coverage on Kawhi. Treat Pascal Siakam with the credit that he deserves. Put his name on the top of that whiteboard in your locker room right next to Kawhi's because, to me, those guys are capable of getting 50 to 60 between them every single game, and I don't think the Sixers really treated Pascal Siakam with enough respect. That has to change. Um, obviously, you know, you'd like to have a little bit more aggressiveness out of Jimmy Butler early in the game. So there's so many things they can improve. That's a good sign for the Sixers because that means that there's a lot there. And when there's a, and if they played great and lost by 15 in Toronto and you really felt like everybody played well, then that's a real problem. They didn't. They didn't play that well. Toronto did. And now they've got to make the adjustment, slow that team down, and, and get this thing to 1-1. But if it is 2-0, you come at home, you can hit the reset button. They've got enough talent. They've been great at home all year. Um, they're not out of it. But, man, does it certainly look a lot better going 1-1 headed in there on Thursday in Wells Fargo. No doubt. Tim Legler, check him out on television, ESPN, breaking down all the playoff games. And uh, Sixers-Raptors tonight right here on 97.3 ESPN. Legs, thanks, pal. Anytime, Mike. Talk all right. Soon. Tim Legler, a guest, appeared via the Boardwalk Honda Hotline.